the Hillcrest Church video. We hope this message will help you grow. So uh, welcome, my name is Tim, and we are continuing this, um, we're kind of combining, we've been in Isaiah through the fall, and now we're in Advent, but we're looking at some Isaiah texts for Advent, and so we're going to continue that this morning. And so um, if you have your Bible with you, uh, I invite you to turn to the book of Isaiah now. We're going to be in Isaiah chapter 8. Uh, where we begin this morning. And Isaiah, if you're new to the Bible, it's a little over halfway um, through. And you can always jump to the table of contents and, and look there uh, for where Isaiah is as well. Uh, yeah, let me, let me pray and then we will get started this morning. Lord God, uh, we do pause and take a breath and acknowledge your presence with us this morning. December, uh, Lord, is often a busy time for us, uh, just uh, in our schedules, but also in our minds. And so we set this time aside uh, to listen for your voice. God, a lot of times this month brings up, just drags stuff up of... um, issues with our families or uh, unmet expectations in life or just how stress affects us. It just brings stuff up in our lives, Lord. And we, uh, we pause now and we take a breath and we desire you to speak a timely and necessary word into our personal lives today. Would you do that through these words of Isaiah? In your name, amen. Amen. All right, I'm going to read. We're going to be at the very end of chapter 8, uh, 8 verse, beginning in verse 21. This is, uh, this is 2,700 years ago. The prophet Isaiah, he's writing, and he is describing people, his countrymen and women, who have turned away from the living God, and they're looking to other sources for spiritual life, spiritual guidance, their sense of identity. He's just describing what's hap- what happens to them when they turn away from God and look to other places for their uh, spiritual life. And so in uh, chapter 8, verse 21, he says, he describes them this way. He says, distressed and hungry, they will roam through the land. When they are famished, they will become enraged and looking upward will curse their king and their God. Then they will look toward the earth and see only distress and darkness and fearful gloom. And they will be thrust into utter darkness. Isaiah, it, he, he uses this language. He says, these, you know, as they turn away, they look to things other than the living God for the spiritual life, they'll become famished and enraged. This is the earliest recorded reference to being hangry. They're, <laughs> they're, but Isaiah, Isaiah is getting at this, he's getting at this, this idea that, uh, look, p- humans are meant, we're meant to get our sense of our identity, our significance, like our, our, the love their life is built on, our meaning, we're meant to get that from the God who created all things. And when we, when we look to other things for that deep sense of identity and security and, um, and, and, and significance, we look to other places, it doesn't satisfy. It leaves people inwardly famished and looking to devour things to try to fill themselves up. And, and in distress, even angry when those things fail to do so. A number of years ago, Christy and I, we, were, we lived in Colorado at the time, and we, uh, we, were, we wanted to do this couple-day backpacking trip, a little summer vacation. And so we get in our um, navy blue uh, 2001 Volkswagen Jetta, and we drive to rural Colorado outside Durango, and the trailhead was like out on five miles of dirt road up in these mountains. And so we're driving, you know, mile one, mile two, mile three, and we're so excited to do on this backpacking trip. Mile four and a half, and all of a sudden, Ka-dunk, we hit something, and the, I see the um, engine temperature light just going up, 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 and a trail of oil through the rear view mirror on the dirt road. And I you know, cut the engine, pull it off, and just oil is pouring out the bottom of the car. Because well, if, if a car doesn't have oil in it, it burns the engine up, right? And you can put anything else you want in that engine. It's not going to work. 
So, you know, we ended up hitching a ride back to town. It kind of ruined the trip. We spent the weekend trying to fix the car instead of spending time together. But is this, if you can't, you, the car has to, it runs, it needs oil in it or it's going to burn up. Isaiah is saying these people who are looking to a source of significance, identity, meaning of spiritual life in other places are like cars running without oil. They are just burning themselves up. And, this, the, the, and it leaves in this inward famish, this hunger, and then even distress, anger, when it's not working. I mean, do we, we see this, right? Well, we see this play out in the lives before us. I think about um, those of us in high school. Like, how many guys in high school are uh, devouring with their eyes and minds girls' bodies? Trying to fill something up inside them. How many girls in high school are literally devouring themselves? Literally going without food for attention. Think about our middle school or high school culture. Like how many, I mean, how much much time is spent cutting others down with words to satisfy something deep inside us? This is this inward hunger. Or or college life, parties, trying to find the sense of who I am. Or sometimes it's not, it's not, sometimes it's it's seeking the sense of significance in things that look good from the outside. So like seeking it in grades, in academic performance, and then I will be secure and be filled up inside. This inward hunger leading to distress and even anger when it doesn't work. I, I, one of the words, I found it so interesting that Isaiah used the word enraged. And I just found myself reflecting on uh, men and anger in our world today. How many, how many adult men live with a secret rage? An anger about uh, perceived futility in life? Uh, unmet expectations, uh, job things that aren't working out, families that haven't turned out the way they imagined, and they just have this, whether it's a hot anger, sometimes a frozen anger, and every now and again you'll see it spill out. It's this, this inner hunger that has gone unmet is leaving people angry. Isaiah says, when, when these people look to things other than God for their deep sense of spiritual life, their sense of who they are, it leaves people famished, in distress, and in the darkness, and wandering, and just looking for something to fill themselves up. Question to reflect on this week. Where is that, I mean, where is it for you? Where is it for me? Like, what is that place where you've been looking to fill yourself up? Where's that inner hunger in your life? You've been looking to this thing to fill yourself up, and it's not working. This thing for your sense of identity, significance, meaning. Isaiah points out these people, they, they're, they're looking to places other than God for this deep um, sense of who they are, their spiritual life. And Isaiah continues uh, in chapter 9, verse 1. And the chapter, of course, the chapter markings are later on. Isaiah, this, Isaiah, this just flowed for him. We added the chapters uh, later on. But uh, chapter 9, verse 1, he continues. He says, Nevertheless, there will be no more gloom for those who are in distress. In the past... He humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the future, he will honor Galilee of the nations by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan. All right, so here um, Isaiah continues. He talks about some specific historical places and events. And I think we have a map here. Zebulun and Naphtali were tribes in ancient Israel with specific tribal land. And their tribal land, you can see up in the north there, um, just around the Sea of Galilee, this was the tribal land of Zebulun and Naphtali. And Isaiah, we've talked in this series about Assyria. Assyria was this um, massive um, military empire in Isaiah's day and actually before 
one after him as well. They ruled for centuries and centuries. But they were a violent, effective war machine. And in Isaiah's day, Assyria was coming and putting pressure on Israel and Judah. And in seven, it was like 733 BC, Assyria rolls in and devours Zebulun and Naphtali. In fact, off in the coastal region of Philistia and up in, in the north um, east in um, Damascus around there. But they just come in and, and decimate them. They, take, they burn the villages. They take uh, the men, women, and children in chains off into exile, and it is gone. And so um, uh, just a decade after that, these regions, next slide, are actually, um, can we hit that next slide there? These regions become just uh, territories of Assyria. In fact, some scholars believe those three phrases at the very end that we read, by the way of the sea, galley of the Gentiles, and across the Jordan, actually were, uh, they stood for these Assyrian provinces that were now controlled by Assyria. And imagine that, I mean, imagine, I mean, this stuff, it's all kind of like this ancient history. Uh, but I mean, try for a second to put yourself, imagine that you don't, you live in what's left of northern Israel or you live in, in um, southern Judah, maybe in a village outside Jerusalem. And you have just seen, you have just seen your cousins in Zebulun and Naphtali. You've seen their villages burned and you've seen cousins taken away into exile and you're wondering when Assyria is coming for your village and your family. And this is this is genuine socio-political fear that people are living with. And it's interesting because in that part in 8, 8, 21, 22, we saw what happens when, what happens when people look kind of inwardly, look for uh, sources of life out other than the living God, and that things go wrong inwardly. But here we see Isaiah referencing that not only do things go wrong in people's hearts, but when, when people base their lives on things other than God, like things go wrong out there as well. Things are wrong in here, but things are also wrong out there. We now live in a world where we have to fear for the safety of our village and if people are going to come and attack our families. This is the world Isaiah is describing, and this is still our world today. This past week, I was listening to the news. I'm driving home, and it's talking about um, school buses in Yemen that have been blown to bits by Saudi Arabia with bombs that say, made in the USA on the side of them. Last weekend, I was at a memorial uh, for a 35-year-old mom who died due to cancer, leaving two little kids behind. This fall, my kids, my first grader, regularly at school, does active shooter drills, where she and another six- and seven-year-olds in her class go in the back class uh, closet. They lock the door, turn the lights off, and they practice being quiet so bad people wouldn't be able to find them if they came to their school. Isaiah says, things have gone wrong in here, and things have gone wrong out there. Where do you feel this? Where do you see this? Where do you see where things have gone wrong in our world today? Or is it personally touching your life this month? Isaiah says things are going wrong in here, things are going wrong out there. And then he continues on in verse 2. And writes, The people walking in darkness... Have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest, as warriors rejoice when dividing the plunder. For as in the day of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor. Every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be fuel for the fire. End of the stage. 
Isaiah here, it's really interesting what he does because he, uh, he you know, he's describing these, this has gone wrong in us, this has gone, these things are wrong outside of us, and then he begins talking about these four great reversals, but he does it in the past tense. Do you notice that? They have seen this light. The, the oppressor has been defeated. Um, freedom has come. But everybody in Isaiah's day would have known these things haven't happened yet. They, they knew that Isaiah was talking about f- future things, but in the past tense, to make the point that this isn't a maybe this will happen, this isn't this we hope this will happen, Isaiah is saying this is as good as done. This will come to pass. And then he names these four great reversals. The first reversal uh, in verse 2 is light for darkness, darkness for light. Where there had been darkness, there will be light. And light is this image of, of spiritual life and guidance. The people who are in the dark will see. The second reversal is in verse 3. And where before there had been fearful gloom, there will now be joy. And just to make the point, we see him say over and over, joy, rejoice, rejoice, rejoice. Four times, like joy is coming. And so those first two reversals, they're more of these inward things, this, this inner spiritual light, this, um, this inner joy, these things will be reversed. And then the next two verses, more outward things. In verse 4, we see um, that this, this, this reversal where there had been a, a, a slavery and oppression, there will now be freedom. I mean, Assyria literally enslaved people. They literally put yokes on people. They literally used bars and rods against people. And what Isaiah is saying is there will be a day when freedom comes in these places. And then the fourth great reversal is this reversing from war and violence to peace. Isaiah describes the implements of war being used in the home oven to cook a meal. War for peace. These four reversals, darkness for light, gloom for joy, slavery for freedom, war for peace. The first two are these inward things. The second two are these outward things. So maybe a question um, for us to just pause on for a second is, um, where do you long for one of these four great reversals to take place? Is there a place in your life, a situation that's been on your mind, that you think, I would love to see this reversal take place there? Isaiah says these four great reversals will happen. It's as good as done. But it kind of leaves the question hanging out there, like, how is this going to happen? What will bring this new state of affairs about? And in verse 6, we get the explanation. The first word of verse 6 is for, because. This is why these reversals take place. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given. And the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Now, this is one of those. This is one of those scriptures that um, you may have heard before, and if you've been around the church, you may have heard a lot of times before. And we can kind of just jump to think, "Oh, I know exactly what that means." But think about again. Think about Isaiah's day. Isaiah, they, they, they're, people are wandering away from God. There, there's this uh, socio political threat over their nation. And, and Isaiah says, This child will be born who will become king. The, answer, the way these reversals will take place, Isaiah says, is a prince will come who will become king. And through his reign, these reversals will take place. This human king, this human king will reverse these things for us. 
And so this, this, there's this hope, this descendant of the great king from the past, David. When will this king come? And so it almost, it almost leaves it like this for Isaiah and his first listeners. It's like a question hanging out there. Who will this king be? It's like this job blank to be filled in. And as you go through the book of Isaiah, we come across this good king, Hezekiah. Is Hezekiah the king who will do this? No, he fails. Later on, you come across this king named Josiah. Is Josiah the good king who will do this? No. Is it Zedekiah? Is he the king who will do it? No. Is it the foreign king Cyrus? Is he the one who will do it? No. Is it one of the Maccabean kings? Are they the ones who will do it? No. And so by the time we come to the first century, and there's this, this child, this descendant of David, born in the rural village of Bethlehem by the name of Yeshua, when he is born, the question still hangs out there. When will this king come to bring these reversals about? See, Christmas, Christmas is about a person arriving. Christmas is not about an idea. It's not uh, for to us an idea is born. To us a philosophy is given. It's not for to us an institution is born. To us a set of rules is given. It's for to us a child, a son, a person has arrived. Who, this child who would be king. I heard a quote. Uh, well, I read it actually um, in the last few weeks, and it, it stuck with me as I was uh, thinking about this passage. And, and the person was talking about how sometimes when we, when we talk about what it means to follow Jesus, we can give this impression that, the, that it's these ideas that you think in your head, and then the result is we'll go to heaven, some other nice place someday. And this person said, that's not the core of Christianity, and that's not the core of Christmas. And they said it this way. Who had this quote? They said, if the, the, the story of Christmas is this, is that if you yearn for someone who is completely trustworthy and virtuous to be put in charge to rule and reign with perfect justice, to put the world right again, if you long for that, Boy, do I have a story for you. The story of Christmas is the announcement of the king arriving to set things right. This is an announcement. This is not good advice. This is, when we talk about Jesus being born, when we talk about Christmas, it's not tips for living. It's not ways to make your life happier, or more efficient. It is simply an announcement of something that has happened. Jesus has stepped into the world. This child, this gift of God to the world, Jesus showed up and said, I am the light that shines in the darkness. Jesus showed up and said, wherever I am, it's like a wedding party that never ends. It is joy. Jesus showed up finding those who were in oppression and enslaved by all sorts of power and setting them free. Jesus showed up to say, I have come to bring peace between you and God and between you and your neighbor. Jesus is the good king, the one who is better than we could have imagined. The king, the leader who says to us, I would rather be tortured and die than let any of my followers, even when they betray me, come to any lasting harm. He is the one we've been longing for. This is an announcement. This is, this is just something that's happened. It's not like here are ideas that you can follow. Here are things that help you live a better life. This is just, this has happened. This is also an announcement about something that is happening, continues to happen. That Jesus, by his spirit, when the spirit of Jesus gets a hold of people's hearts, when the Spirit of Jesus gets a hold of families, gets a hold of neighborhoods, gets a hold of churches, when His Spirit gets a hold of places, they start hearts and friendships and communities start to look more like the world that Isaiah described. It's an announcement that something 
that Jesus is continuing to do in this world. And then not only is it an announcement about something that God has done in Jesus, that something God is continuing to do through the Spirit of Jesus, this is an announcement about something that God will bring to future completion in Jesus. This is an announcement that Jesus is going to come back again. And darkness and fearful gloom and oppressive slavery and violent war and cancer that cuts lives short do not get the last word. Christmas is an announcement that a day will come, a day is coming, when the reign of Jesus will be everywhere forever and always. And he will put this world to right. This is good news. I want to take a moment and I want to explore a couple implications of this announcement with you. First implication, just two of them I just want to talk about. In fact, why don't, why don't the worship team come back up? Because um, we'll uh, wrap up here in just a second. The first implication is this. I think, um, I think a lot of our world today, a lot of the uh, modern Western world, what some people call the post-Christian world, um, still carries this ethical vision. And there's this heart to have the kingdom of Jesus without the king. And we long for this kind of peace. We long for people to be set free. We long for people to have joy. We still carry this ethical vision of the kingdom of Jesus. But there's this cutting off of the ground, of the power, and the hope. And I believe that the pursuing of the kingdom without the king is, it just doesn't work. It will come. It will not work in our personal lives. It will not work in our society. And maybe you're one of those people and you've been longing, you've been yearning, you've been working to see this kind of world come about, but you haven't had the ground for it, you haven't had the power for it, you haven't had any hope that this will really happen. And maybe today is the day that you say, I want the king with the kingdom. Maybe you've been on the fence about following Jesus, and today is the day that you say, I'm in. He's my king. I believe he is coming again. If that's you, I'd invite you uh, to, to take these next couple songs and, and do business with God. Talk to him about that. And then talk to myself or Christian or one of the other pastors after the service about that decision. And that's the first implication. The second implication is this. For those of us who... Uh, you're here and you're like, Tim, I believe this is true. This is my king. This is the one I follow. This is the one who my hope is in. This is what I would like to, us, to invite us to do today. I would like to invite us to sing. To sing it out. In fact, will you stand now? There are these times, there's these truths. Sometimes things in, in, in Christianity are things that we have to respond to and do. And sometimes it's just about singing and praising and getting ourselves into the truth of it and letting the truth of it get into us. There's a quote, E. Stanley Jones, um, who said it this way, the early Christians did not say in dismay, look what the world has come to, but said in delight, look what has come to the Amen. world. Yeah. For to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given. and other sermons, visit us online at hcbellingham.com or join us at 9 or 11 a.m. any Sunday morning.
1400 Larrabee Ave, Bellingham, Washington. <laughs>